Welcome to the Better Policies for Women in Food System webinar hosted by the OECD. My name is Vidya Shankar Narayan, and I'm the Assistant Deputy Minister for Information Systems at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in the Government of Canada. And I'm also the co-champion for diversity and inclusion. Today, we will be discussing how to foster greater opportunities for women in agriculture by talking about data collection, evidence gaps, and notional experiences in inclusive food systems policymaking. So first, let's do a little bit of housekeeping. Today's webinar will be recorded and live streamed on both YouTube and Zoom. And as you would have already seen on the agenda, we will have a 15 minutes questions and answers session after the presentations. Therefore, I encourage all of you in the audience joining us on Zoom to start putting in your questions in the chat thread. The questions and answers is only available on Zoom and not on YouTube. Likewise, to keep us engaged, I invite those joining on Zoom to keep your cameras on if you would like. So today, we have a very strategic panel lined up, and I'm really excited to be the chair for today's panel. We will start with introductory remarks from two of our very key panelists. First would be Minister Cecilia Lopez and followed by Dr. Marianne Jansen. So a little bit about our first two speakers. Cecilia Lopez is the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development of Colombia. As an economist, Ms. Lopez has a long history working in the public sector and has encompassed many roles in government, such as Minister of Environment, Director of National Planning, Department and the Director of National Planning Department and Colombian Ambassador to the Netherlands. She also held different positions as an international consultant at the World Bank and IFAD, but was also on the board of directors at IFPRI and World Health Organization. She's been active in Cartagena's feminist initiative and promoted the creation of An Music, an association of rural and indigenous women. Her experiences are admirable to say the least, and her list of accomplishments is really quite long to list all of them right now. But we would like to thank the minister very much for joining us today, which is a special day for her that I also share with her today. It's her birthday and it is my birthday as well. So really a, uh, a very interesting day for women in agriculture. Our second speaker to start off with would be Dr. Marion Jansen. She is the director of the Trade and Agriculture Directorate of the OECD. In this role, she provides intellectual stewardship and strategic vision to the directorate. She also oversees cutting edge analyses, advice, and support for policy reform in the fields of food, agriculture, fisheries, and international trade. Before joining the OECD, Dr. Jansen was the director for the Division of Market Development and chief economist at the International Trade Center in Geneva. She also held different positions in the Economic Research and Statistics Division of the World Trade Organization and has lectured in multiple academic institutions. Thank you to Varian and her team for organizing today's webinar, which as we know, takes a lot of effort to get set up. So without further ado, let's start with you, Minister, over to you. Since we are all over the world, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, OECD colleagues. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this event where we will be able to address how to design better policies for women in food systems. I would like to thank the OECD and the participating countries for inviting Colombia to share experiences on gender matters in agriculture. 
Special thanks to Mrs. Marion Jensen for this for this invitation and to Mrs. Celine Diner, Mrs. May Hobeka, and Mrs. Shara Fischetti for elaborating the report. Colombia would also li like to congratulate the OECD team as well as the collaborating countries and organizations for, for providing very useful information for this paper, which will facilitate the inclusion of gender policy in our policy plans. We join efforts today to better understand the need to raise awareness on the importance of the participation of women in the economy, particularly in the agricultural sector. While preparing to the, for this conference, I kept reaching the same conclusion. Rural women are the forgotten, forgotten contributors of rural development. I thought it was only a characteristic of developing countries. However, after attending two different agricultural minister summits, I realized it is not so. Rural women's invisibility is a fact across the sector all over the world. I kept wondering if this is a constant for rural women. Well, I believe that the reason is historically well known. Since women are seen as caregivers first, their productive activities are not only underestimated, but especially considered marginal. In the case of Colombia, for example, between 2020 and 2021, 93% of rural women were involved in unpaid care work, compared to 56% for rural. Impressive figures, especially for men. However, rural women spend eight hours and 33 minutes doing unpaid work during a day, but it's called unpaid care economy while men spend only three hours. That explains the low participation of rural women in the economic and productive activities, 36%. 42 points, percentage points lower than the rate for men. This all means that women's daily agenda in care is already a work day. And when added productive activities, it becomes 16 or 17 hours a day that women have can spend. This is twice as much as the workload for men. The question I want to raise is, can women really contribute to food systems with such long journeys? I think not. Care economy then, unpaid care economy, is then a key variable. If we want really that rural women can be productive, can contribute to food system, we have to take that load of care in a way that market, in a way that market and uh, the state can assume part of this load. That means that we have to recognize that care activities are also productive, something that during 300 years, the economists have not recognized. We need them urgent solution to level the play field for men and women. It's the only way that women can really contribute. We have to reduce inequality, and for that, we need to know more about how the women use their hours of the day, how unbalanced that is between men and women. We are pleased that Colombia has been considered to share experiences on gender approach in the agricultural sector. Undoubtedly, this is a long path ahead to attain equal conditions for women, for rural women, for which our collective work is an essential way to achieve it. Finally, I would like to thank the ODCD for providing this scenario and the participating countries for their commitment to this objective. We are looking forward to the conversations and conclusions arising from this event, hoping that all countries take valuable information for the development and upgrade our, of our policy plans. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. So now I would like to uh, welcome uh, Marion Jansen to provide us with her opening remarks. Thank you very much, uh, dear um, 
Minister uh, Cecilia Lopez Montano, dear Assistant Deputy Minister Vindia Shankana Rayan, dear panelists, dear friends, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, and above all, happy birthday, Vindia and Cecilia. And thank you for being with us on this special day. Um, I can assure you that this is also a special topic that we are going to discuss today, a special topic for the OECD, as we have at the OECD placed the theme of gender equality really at the top of our agenda. Um, already in its vision statement of 2021, the OECD vision statement, our members uh, affirmed our commitment to accelerating the development of policies, policy options to help closing gender gaps and to ensure that all our analysis, research, and policy advice integrates a gender equality perspective. As we are speaking in this period, the organization is developing for the first time in its history a gender strategy. And I'm very confident that we will use that strategy to make progress on our agenda on gender inclusion. And I'm, I'm confident because as we are developing the strategy, we are already developing the OECD gender data portal. So we will make sure that we collect data that will allow us to measure progress on the commitments that we are making. And that topic data is important, and I will come back to it in the rest of my speech. Um, as the Director of Trade and Agriculture, we are also ensuring that gender is mainstreamed in our work on trade and the work we are discussing here on agriculture and food systems. And I'm particularly um, pleased to be here today to discuss this topic, um, how to develop better policies for women in food systems, because it is part of our follow-up to not only the OECD vision statement, not only implementation of our gender strategy, but it is also a follow-up of the ministerial declaration that was um, concluded at the end of last year. And Cecilia, we were very pleased to have you with us at that ministerial meeting. In that uh, declaration on transformative solutions for sustainable agriculture and food systems, um, commitments were included to promote and measure progress towards inclusive food systems and to reinforce measures to foster great opportunities for women in the agricultural sector. So some of our members, I'm notably thinking of Canada and Spain, they are already adapting uh, gender mainstreaming in such a way that they have uh, specific policies in place for, uh, to assess the implications for women and men and plan any planned action in the agricultural and food sector. And if any of the countries present here today wants to think in this direction, uh, you may want to take an example on these countries and you will find a legal anchor, an international legal anchor for such action in the OECD ministerial declaration. In the OECD secretariat, my team has been taking a closer look at the roles women play in food systems and uh, what is needed to amplify their contributions. Our recent report on gender and food systems highlights that fostering gender inclusion can have positive impacts on what we call the triple challenge for food systems. It's the challenge um, to provide food security and nutrition for a growing population, the second challenge of providing livelihoods for hundreds of millions of people working in the sector. And the third challenge to ensure environmental sustainability. With the show in that report that there is um, poss possibly a very strong positive impact, we also show in that report that these positive synergies are often not visible. And this is because of two challenges. First, a gender perspective is rarely applied when food system policies are developed. And second, sex disaggregated information, and here I'm back at the topic of data, is generally very often not collected. So how can we improve on women's contribution to food systems if we don't measure what they are doing and if we do not fully understand their experiences? We need to understand better how women contribute to food systems as both entrepreneurs and as workers. For example, we would need more information on the barriers to enhance women's entrepreneurship in food systems. 
We would also need more information on their involvement in informal activities in family farms, and we heard about this already from uh, Minister Lopez. And third, we would also need information on their involvement in agricultural innovations. Women have the potential to be a driver of innovation and progress, and we need to understand how to optimize that potential. Today, we will learn from the experiences of Colombia, Japan, Germany, and Scotland in overcoming evidence gaps on these aspects. We will hear how uh, this information can be used to develop a successful combination of food system specific and economy-wide policy instruments to support women both as workers and entrepreneurs in food systems. We are also going to hear about the challenges that these countries face related to the implementation of policies and the assessment of their effectiveness. My colleague, Celine, whom you have already heard, Celine Giner, who is responsible for the work on gender and food systems at the OECD and who is behind the report that I just mentioned, will provide more insights about this report later on, and in particular about the roadmap for overcoming evidence gaps on gender aspects and policies that address gender inequality in food systems. We will then hear about policymakers' experience, as mentioned before. I'm delighted that you, Minister Cecilia Lopez, you provide insights on the Colombian experience on this special day uh, for you. Thank you again for being with us today on your birthday. I hope you will enjoy this uh, webinar. I hope you, Vidya, will enjoy the webinar and I will look forward to listening to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Marion and Minister Lopez. Yes, we've definitely off to a great start. I think we're going to have a really interesting discussion here today. And so for me, coming from Canada and responsible for digital data and innovation in the Canadian agriculture landscape, women in food systems is extremely important. In Canada, we have gender parity in our federal cabinet. We have gender-based analysis in all our programming. So the more we can work together, because from a Canadian perspective, 10% of our GDP is agriculture. That is big for us. And we, of course, produce way more than we consume. One in eight jobs in Canada is in agriculture and food systems. So it would be really interesting for us to continue this conversation. And of course, today's discussion is going to be even more interesting. So now I would like to pass on the, I would say the speaker, uh, Mike, over to our OECD agriculture policy analyst, who is no stranger to any of you, Céline Genet, who in a way is why we are all here today. She has been working very, I would say, uh, tirelessly on this topic, and she will be speaking to us for about 10 minutes about gender and food systems report that this webinar is centered around. So over to you, Celine. Well, thanks very much, Vidya, and thanks, Marion. Um, well, dear minister, dear participants, my name is Celine Giné, and I'm, I'm working at the Trade and Agriculture Directorate of the OECD on, on food systems policies. And today I want to present the key insights from the recent OECD report on gender and food systems. Um, well, I want to start by thanking um, the Minister Cecilia Lopez for supporting the organization of this event. Uh, Marion Jensen just um, told us that um, while well, taking steps towards tangible outcomes for women uh, was a key part of the discussions of the OECD ministerial uh, meeting of um, agriculture ministers that was held in November 2022. In fact, on the side of the ministerial meeting, we discussed the possibility of organizing this high level event that would bring together um, policy experts and, and raise awareness on how to overcome evidence gaps on the contribution of women to food systems. And here we are today, uh, four months after, around this virtual table. Um, I want um, to thank the two colleagues who worked with me on the project, May Hobeka and Chiara Fischetti, and to stress that this report is the result of a collaboration uh, with 10 OECD countries. So the countries around the table today, uh, and also Australia, um, Chile, New Zealand, Spain, and, and Switzerland. 
I will be providing a very short presentation because we want to hear about the policy experiences of Colombia, Japan, Germany and Scotland in advancing gender equality in food systems. So next slide, please. Um, first, a bit of background. Um, this um, report on gender and food system is part of um, a series of reports on overcoming evidence gaps uh, that were released in 2022. We've worked also on food insecurity and food assistance programs across OECD countries and on environmental impacts along agro-food supply chains. Um, you, you may be interested in, in the policy brief that we've just, in the short policy brief that we've just published, uh, which uh, provides the main learnings of these four reports um, for policymakers um, on this question of overcoming evidence gaps. Um, if we get back to the gender report, while well, it covers three main aspects, the first one is to understand the role of women in food systems as entrepreneurs and workers, uh, and to a smaller extent, consumers as well. And they were using a framework that was developed uh, for the OECD work on trade and gender. Second, this report reviews policy instruments to support women across food systems. And finally, it provides a roadmap for advancing gender equality in food systems. So that's basically a guide to policymakers and, and to the wider society on advancing gender equality. Um, well, one important point to stress is that we treat here gender aspect as binary. So we focus on the roles of women and men across food systems. Um, we do not cover evidence gaps related to the contribution and specific needs of sexual or gender minorities in food systems, and this will need uh, require further um, attention. Uh, can we move to the next slide, please? So few few uh, figures, uh, interesting facts because we like numbers at the OECD. One point to stress is that um, quite often women are invisible, as told by the minister, because sex disaggregated data is not collected. Uh, however, well, we can here find few interesting figures just to provide an overview. In terms of farm ownership, um, well, less than 30% of farms are owned by women in, in many OECD countries. Uh, in terms of work, um, there we we um, we uh, so the World Bank and ILO say that um, about 33 percent of agricultural workers in 2021 were women. Uh, this is much lower um, than the number for developing countries, which is close to 70 percent. In terms of um, wage gap, well, data from the UK annual survey of hours and earnings show that women across food systems tend to earn less than their men counterparts. And um, a bit of a better picture, um, according to the, to the OECD intellectual property database, women produce about 40% of agricultural related patents in the OECD. Um, so it's, they're rather well represented among patent holders compared to their representation in the sector. Uh, can we move to the next slide, please? Um, so this slide here summarizes what we, um, um, some of the key learnings from the report on the role of women in food systems. So there are things that we know uh, widely and things that are not well understood. Um, it appears that women as entrepreneurs tend to be concentrated in less profitable service related activities. When in situation of co-entrepreneurship, their contribution to decision making is not widely understood. In fact, um, uh, the US agricultural census tells us that um, women farm producers tend to focus on day-to-day -day activities. Um, as workers, um, well, we've heard from the minister, uh, women are strongly involved in informal activities. Um, they receive for that no pay and little recognition. For formal activities, we have um, little information on wages, uh, except for the UK, and little information on career paths. So there's a lot which is unknown, uh, um, and we can do better. Uh, can we move to the next slide, please? So this now leads us to the set of policy instruments implemented across OECD countries with the aim of advancing women's contribution to food systems. Um, 
countries that collaborated with the OECD on the project have developed a targeted policy mix, which is made of food system specific tools and, and economy wide tools. Uh, you can look at the instruments that are being used here on the slide uh, and we'll get some practical examples in the panel discussion. Um, so we'll directly move to the next slide, which is um, very important. Um, in fact, this is the um, the, the five-step roadmap that uh, we are proposing in our report for advancing gender equality in food systems. And this roadmap is really meant as a guide to policymakers. Um, the first step is to highlight gender issues in food systems policies. Uh, we need to recognize that um, gender is an important topic. We need to apply a gender lens uh, when developing food systems policies, because this will help uh, advance gender equality. The second step um, is to identify and close evidence gaps. So data, 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 we need information. Uh, that means that this may seem obvious. We need to collect gender disaggregated data. Um, this seems obvious, but this is not often done across OECD countries. We need this data to understand the contribution of women to food systems, the benefits uh, greater gender equality will bring, and as well as the barriers that women are facing. Then, and then only then, once we've understood the problem, we need to develop and implement policies to address gender equality inequality and and unfortunately there's no silver bullet so we need a policy mix a targeted policy mix um, with policy instruments selected to help women overcome the barriers we've mentioned and to support uh, greater gender equality one important step is a fourth step which is about monitoring and evaluating policy impacts and uh, policy effectiveness these uh, evaluations can be undertaken at the national level, but also at the international level to track progress and compare performance across countries. And this does not exist yet. Um, in that sense, both ex ante and ex post gender impact assessments are very, are really useful. And the final step uh, is to adjust policy responses. Um, when we have uh, if we collect better evidence then uh, this will lead to improved policy responses and and policy adjustment should consider several aspects this is ethical aspects organizational aspects budgetary aspects as well as effectiveness um can we move to the next slide please and in fact, I'll, I'll stop here because I think, Madam Chair, the most important is to hear about the, the data collection efforts and policy experiences of the countries that are around this table. Um, you can contact me uh, if you have any questions about the report or want to learn more. And I thank you all very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Celine. That was an excellent presentation. And now we are going to be moving on to Minister Lopez and her team for the next presentation. Over to you, Minister. Thank you very much. Well, I will move to the, I call closing evidence across gaps on gender and food systems, Colombia's roadmap. I, please, let's go to the next one. I will call this the frustration route. <laughs> this is a route full of frustrations. It started in 1981. Remember, I was Vice Minister of Agriculture in the 80s, and I was Minister of Agriculture in the 90s. And now again, in, in, in 2022. Well, I have a long story here. So we started with CEDAW. CEDAW what CEDAW said about women, we, we joined that idea. Then we included gender as a key issue in our new constitution, the Constitution of Rights. Then the rights of women were clearly there. Then, uh, because of that, we have a rural women law, a law in 2002 that hasn't been developed because it's, why this is a frustration path. Then in uh, 2010, as a senator, I, I launched the law. I worked very hard for this law. It was very difficult, the care economy law. That law said two things. One, you have to measure that. And as we'll be saying constantly along this presentation, 
The care economy in Colombia, the unpaid care economy, represents 20% of GDP. The rural sector contributes to 5%. The industrial sector contributes to 11%. So this is twice as much as the industrial sector and nobody recognizes as a productive sector. I almost didn't, and the other thing I said in that note is that those activities are productive and they should be part of national accounts. I couldn't get that. The only thing that I could get was, uh, um, how do you call it? The, the, the satellite account measuring the 20% of the contribution, but not part of the economy. That's my great frustration. Then we, uh, because of all of this, a rural women directory was created in the ministry. Do we have that office that was dead by in the last five, six, eight years? So it is not enough to have a law. It is not enough to have an institution. Then it was created the Rural Women Institutional Committee. Nothing happened. They created it. was a decree. Then there was a, a, a lot of studies between uh, 2018 and 2021. There were a lot, a lot of studies on gender equality and public policy. They didn't mention the load of care, of unpaid care. And finally, we got to today, the National Development Plan. There we are. Care economy. It, you know, we propose and we hope they accept it. Care, unpaid care economy will be recognized as a productive sector and it will be the reason why we have to give land to women because we are in the middle of, of the bread and reform that Colombia has postponed for decades. The next one. So the, this is the road of frustrations. We have elements, but the results are not there. You will see. The next one, please. Okay, so uh, this office, this, uh, this part of the ministry was created by, by law. Uh, it was uh, since, to, to, since that law, the objective of this uh, office, this directorate, was to strengthen care mechanisms for rural and peasant women to overcome social, economic, gender gaps in rural development sector. Uh, they tried very hard, but I will say that if you don't have a really a commitment, a framework, a policy framework that is really recognized as important, you, you cannot do much. And this is a good example of that. Of course, they try very much to have a, to show the vital cycle, the, the problems of disability, they included the variables and LGBTQ recognition. But in terms of results, let's see what happened. The next one, please. Okay, so what this office has done is trying to measure the contribution of rural women to the Colombian food system. Uh, there, there was an agricultural national survey. Well, you know what happened to women in the rural sector is what had happened to the rural sector in Colombia. That, that is why that we have to recognize that it was a forgotten sector because we were supposed to be more efficient if we import food. We are paying the price for that. We lost a lot of, of the contribution, especially of poor, of poor peasants. We put all the emphasis in, in exports, but today the inflation of food in Colombia is explained basically by the imports of some of the main uh, 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 inputs for basic food, like eggs, milk, yeah, uh, meat, because we are importing corn, we're importing wheat, we're importing soybeans, and that is, that is only 15% of what people, uh, of, of all the needs for, for food supply. But they explain 60% of the inflation of food in Colombia. So we have to substitute in. Then we have, uh, there was a agricultural a statistical plan. There were statistical information. There were all kinds of analysis. But let's move to the next one. And you will see what happened. So we have. The most important point that I want to, to bring, I think we are underestimating the fact that women spend their journey on care and paid care, at least in the developing countries. I am not sure, I don't know how different it is, but I was looking at some of the results for the, for the countries so OECD, and I, I wonder if there is such a huge difference between developed and other 
develop. Uh, if, a, if a woman, you know, you're supposed to have eight hours of work, eight hours, eight hours of leisure, and eight hours to rest. If women is paid more than eight hours in unpaid care, anything that she does that is productive is reducing leisure time or the time to rest. We are underestimating that. That's why we have to get care out of the home, at least a big part of it. This is a message I want to, to put it very clear. So that's why we are working very hard here. I will, telling you what I already told you, we have the care economy satellite account. We were not able to, that care, unpaid care will be recognized as a productive sector. Nobody in the world recognizes that unpaid care work today is an economic productive activity. In no country it has been done. That's why I want to be the Colombia, the first one. Let's see if I am able to do that. It is in Congress now to see if they approve that. National time survey that show us what I told you, women spend disproportionately more time daily on unpaid care. You, this uh, data I already gave you, the economic value of care economy represent 20.6% of GDP. Uh, in, uh, of that amount, 50.8 is the contribution of women. Next one. I want to move to the results. Um, well, as this one, I already, I already said it, I'll move to the next one. Okay, so what happened? Uh, we have, I don't know if we missed the one, the mutation of the of the this kind of water. Before uh, talking to that, uh, the points are uh, no, I want to go to care economy and rural women, women time use. I go back. Okay, let's see this. We have 5.8 million women in the rural sector. Of those 5.8 million, we have less women than men only in the rural sector. Only 3,700 have been beneficiaries of productive projects. Can you see? If we don't do something, this is ridiculous. This is a minimum proportion. 28,000 women have been beneficiaries of the special line of credit. Nothing. All, all of this is nothing. Women are in the service sector. Women are getting in Colombia out of the agricultural sector. Of course, there is no support for women in the productive sector. Is that the way we want women to contribute to food? Systems? No way. No way. It, you know they, why? I think that they don't have time and they are invisible. I mean, I think this is a very important point. If women, and they were not discussed in, this, in these meetings of the ministers, even of the ECD, and it, but even worse, in the meeting we have in Berlin, where we have ministers of agriculture for all over the world. They talk about the youth, they talk about the old people that are in the rural sector, no women issues. If you don't talk about rural women, you don't have policies for them. You don't know what's ha happening with rural women. One big conclusion I want to bring here, we have to learn how rural women live, especially in the developing world. But I guess we should do more, be more careful about understanding the life of rural women if we really want them to be very productive. Now we can move on. The next one, please. Then, what do we want, do we need to do? Now, I, if, if you want to have a real rural reform, if you want to really make the rural sector productive, you have to recognize that you have to work with women. So you have to be very careful about the rural women public policy. You have to put gender and mainstreaming in rural development sector. What, do, what are the main issues? We have to distribute land. This is the key element in Colombia because we have a genie of land of 0.87. Can you imagine? It's one of the worst of the world. So we have to distribute land. So the first point is access and formalization of land. For that, we have to recognize that unpaid care is, an, is a reason, is an explanation, is a, is a fact for giving women land. Then we have to include them financially. You saw very few of them have access to credit. But we have to make an inclusion that is not subsidies, it's a productive inclusion. We have to give them land and credit. And we have to recognize that we have to take care 
economy and take care economy out of the house. And we have to accompany that land distribution for projects. And then we have to see what type of projects and what are the conditions that women need to be part of those projects. One of them is food production, of course. Next one. What do we have to do? We really have to do something. This is so new in the case of Colombia, and I guess in many developing countries, that we have to really know, especially what is the life of women? How do they live? What is the impact of all of these policies? In the case of Colombia, land, productive inclusion, economic access, financial inclusion. Then we have to make a follow-up on how these policies will impact women. But finally, we will have to evaluate results of care economy, productive initiatives to be implemented over the following years. You know what I'm doing? And please follow this to see if we have exit. I want to make an empirical proof that getting out care economy out of the house of the rural women and being distributed uh, in the, with the government and in the market will increase their productivity, their participation in the labor market, the increase in production, and they will result in, in a larger GDP. If I do that, then we'll have care economy recognized as a productive sector. And that change, that will change the life of rural women among all the women in the world, because urban women still suffer, especially in developing countries, the impact of not being recognized as productive, but only as caregivers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister Lopez. And uh, really, I would say is that when you spoke about the empirical evidence, what you've shared with us today is data that is not only just for us to leverage, it's really, I mean, we have members from around the world here and how can we work together to make women more prominent and also to actually have gender parity and equality what really caught my attention in your presentation was the unpaid work. When on one hand, labor market issues are, I would say, uh, just rising across the board, even in a country like mine in Canada, we have significant challenges in the labor market and skilled labor. So I'm really excited now to move into the next part of our discussion here today, because we have, three key members from around the world who are going to be joining us now for a roundtable discussion. So once again, thank you, Minister Lopez, and thank you, Celine, who has played such a big role in bringing us together here. So moving on to introduce our three roundtable discussion panelists. From Japan, we have Ritsuko Yoneda, who is director to the OECD in the International Affairs Department of the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry, and Fisheries. Next, we have from Germany, Cornelia Burns, who is head of the Directorate for International Cooperation and World Food Affairs at the Federal Ministry of Food and Agriculture. And last but not least, we have Fiona Leslie, head of Agricultural Holdings and Women in Agriculture team from Scotland. So thank you, three of you, for being here today. And we will start with the first question to you and would really encourage each of you to have about three minutes each, starting with Japan, Germany, and Scotland to respond to this question. So the first question is, what does data tell you about the situation of women working in food systems? Over to you, Ritsuko. Hi, um, good afternoon, good evening from Tokyo. I'm Ritsuko Neda, as introduced. And um, thank you for then providing me with the, this opportunity. And perhaps um, many of you have an image like and Japan is one of, one of the country which has the most um, the severe gender gap in the world, but it's halfway halfway true and halfway false. And I can share some uh, in, inter, um, interesting data with you first. And the, when we look at the um, farming population, and especially the coal farmer, which uh, mean that the uh, farmers who has a, who has a 
who rely on um, their main income source is an, um, farming activity, over 40% is a female. And also, and the, um, some data said that the um, farming business entity, which include women in the exec ex executive position, makes more profit compared to others. But when we look at the um, new entrant, new entrant incoming farmers population, and the women uh, share is going down to 24%, and which mean that, which imply that and the uh, women entrepreneurship is an issue. But however, when we look at the, um, the um, processing facilities, which is really closely located to the uh, farming um, area, rural area, all workers are female and really female dominated in the world. So you know, people understand, people understand um, rural area cannot survive without the women power. But the problem is the visibility and I guess and uh, um, the data sets. And, and this is in the, um, previously shared by Celine that the um, women is less participated to the decision making process, and especially in the rural council or uh, agricultural cooperatives. That is a major problem and which uh, Japan is facing now. And so that is um, um, how to um, how how to improve that situation is a main policy issue now Japan is facing, and it, um, perhaps um, it is one of the reason that um, the traditional farming activity is uh, kind of dominated by the, um, the traditional. Um, customary and division of roles, women are mainly devoted to the housekeeping kind of operation or um, the care worker, care working, um, so to speak. So um, how to um, change that situation in the um, future um, policy challenge we are facing now? Thank you, over to you. Thank you, Rutsoko. Over to you, Cornelia. Thank you very much and hello to all of you. It's true for shaping political processes, we have to know about the reality of work and life for women in agriculture and rural areas. The regular agricultural census in Germany only examines a very limited set of data, for example, women in agricultural workforce. Therefore, the Federal Ministry of Food and Agriculture in Germany has commissioned a nationwide study in 2019 and is currently working on how to implement the recommendations. The study specifically examines more broadly the situation of women in agriculture. We are sharing the link in the chat. The study looked from working conditions to social and legal security and to infrastructure in rural areas and the importance of female volunteering. In the study, more than 7,000 women participated in a detailed survey and activities like workshops, interviews, and online questionnaires. The results are really of concern and pose a major challenge. Women run only 11% of farms in Germany and they inherit only 18% of farms. Compared to that, about one third of employees in agriculture are women. The study underlined limited access to land and especially traditional role models make it difficult for women to become farm managers. Young female farmers face a multitude of demands, especially caring for children and managing a farm at the same time. High intrinsic motivation of female employees and trainees contrast with high workloads. Reconciling work and family life is also a challenge in agriculture. Despite challenging living and participation conditions, Women in agriculture volunteer in various areas. Agriculture is still a sector with, in uh, which a lot of trenches physical work is done. This can lead to physical strain and overload, illness, signs of wear and tear and the risk of accidents. 
position on the farm and work situation are interdependent and the multiple demands on women who live or work on farms are high. Role conflicts can lead to mental strain and social security for women still needs improvement. German agriculture is facing major challenges. Besides global challenges, demographic change and the pluralization of lifestyles require a sustainable transformation of the agricultural economy and way of life. And women need to be part of that. Important steps on this part are safe and fair working conditions, the realization of gender equality in work, family and voluntary work, as well as the recognition of diversity in life. Thank you. Thank you, Cornelia. Over to you, Fiona. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Fiona Leslie from the Scottish Government, and um, I'd just like to set this into a wee bit of context first. So in, in Scotland, our population is five and a half million, of which one million is in rural Scotland, and about half is um, women and girls aged 13 and above. Now, the 13 and above becomes important later on. Um, on our farms, um, about 40% of women and um, children aged 16 plus, um, so that's girls aged 16 plus, are identified as being involved in the agricultural business. So um, it's important just to put that in context. So in Scotland, we are significantly committed to supporting women in food systems. And over the past decade, we have altered our approach to data collection. So before 2016, we didn't collect any data about unpaid family labour on farms and crofts. For, crofts are a type of Scottish farming system, um, which is akin to semi-subsistence. Um, so the, when we started collecting this data, we had a bunch of women and other family members that popped up um, on the data set that were providing labour on farms, predominantly unpaid. So um, that getting that understanding of the reliance of the business on the unpaid labour is important to policy development and national strategies. So it's important to understand that. And over, unsurprisingly, during COVID, we saw a 12% increase of female, female family members undertaking support on farms in terms of labour. Um, so regular data collection about the role of women in Scottish agriculture is to assess progress on policy delivery for us. And we have been considering the need to alter our terminology and certain data collection elements. So for example, the next Scottish agricultural census, we will no longer be referring to spouses. We'll be talking about partners because that enables all genders to um, self-identify instead of people thinking more traditional norms. So that will help us pick up um, transgender and other groups. And terminology is critical. And we consider the phrasing around full-time and part-time is of particular relevance to people. So um, Scottish women farmers will often self-identify as part-time if they do 40 hours a week because their husbands do 80 or 100 hours a week. And although the rest of the Scottish population considers that to be a full-time post or a full-time job, in the agricultural community, the cultural norm is that is not full-time, that is part-time. So they may work full-time in another job off farm and come home and do another 40 hours on top. So it's worth considering that when you're doing your development. And um, because this affects perception, self-worth, the role within the farm and how they're perceived within a member of the farming business. Um, and we are also, although we're making steps to significantly progress things for women um, through our funded Women in Agriculture Development Programme and the land matching service, both identified in the OECD report, the land ownership and land tenure issues identified in the FEO UN report are of relevance to our country as well. So though we are a developed country, and 40% of the women are involved in the farms. Women still lack behind on the number of women in control of the farm, the croft or the tenant farm. So the cultural norm of passing the farm on to the son is still remaining with only 13% of crofts, 10% of farms and 8% of tenant farms 
is having women as head of the business. So that doesn't, you know, that's not taking us to 50%. So we are still miles behind in that. So while we are making strong progress in the practical delivery and the solutions we're bringing forward, until we see the effect of that in the longer term and we measure that long-term change in control of the land, that will not actually determine the real degree of cultural change that's happening. So until you actually see that in your country, that your percentage of the number of people in control of the farm increases by gender type, you will not actually be able to assess if your policies are working in the longer term. So I think that's a key takeaway that we've come to a conclusion on because we can see we're, we're investing a lot of money in this, but we do have a long way to go. And until you see that cultural flip happen, then we are not going to get the gender parity that I think everybody on this call is, is looking for. I'm going to stop talking because I'm over my allegation. Thank you, Fiona. Really, thank you to all three uh, speakers. Uh, I just have to say is that in 2023, the number of gaps and challenges women face, it is uh, really a, a the time that we all come together as OECD member states to make this change, but also make a difference. So looks like we actually have time for another round of questions to our three speakers. So the second round of questions to all three of you, for it's the same format, you each have three minutes, is how is gender considered in your food systems policies as a result? And so I'll repeat the question, how is gender considered in your food systems policies as a result? And let's start with the same uh, grouping, starting with Ritsuko, then Cornelia, and then with Fiona. Over to you, Ritsuko. Thank you. Um, in sharing any Japanese experience in responding to your second question, and in now Japanese government is taking an, an different two um, approaches to solve this problem. And the first one is about the on how to increase the, on the number of female into the decision making process. And as I speak a couple of minutes ago, and then also how to um, raise the, um, the leaders position a uh, woman who is in a leader's position and in that perspective and the Japanese government in uh, support uh, so in supporting the women's activity so-called farming women project and which um, um, is providing some um, and some lectures some um, pro programs to 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 um, raise the women, young women workers, uh, young women farmers into their leaders position, and they, um, they are their activities to organize a women's group in uh, each area. And the, that kind of and leaders position, uh, that kind of woman who is in leaders position can be a role model for the for other young farmers, women work farmers, and they and they take some uh, take that kind of steps, and the position of women in rural area can be improved more and more. The second approach is the technology, and they, and as the minister said, and the farming activity has a really and hard heavy duty and heavy workload, but and it was using the technology, and then that can. That kind of and um, heavy um, working can be reduced. The workload can be reduced. And for example, then the, um, uh, using digital technology or some machinery has been developed, and to um, enable women and carry some heavy um, containers or some um, heavy packages. And they, so uh, in order to do that, so that um, the female worker can work and, they, and, and, and can be productive and they, twice or third times more. And in that, in that perspective, um, as recently, and Japanese um, the female workers group is now collaborating with the and some machinery and industries and also other um, private companies to develop some um, some and facility the equipment you know, which is easy to use for female. That kind of activity is um, 
now Japanese government is supporting. Um, and and um, in the conclusion, we have um, two different um, approaches and decision making, and also using technologies. Thank you, over. Thank you, Rutsuko. Cornelia, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, an important step in, in, in Germany was the 1995 Agricultural Social Reform Act, which included the independent provision of farmer spouses in the old age insurance scheme for farmers. The rural women interest groups had long demanded this. The in, Independent insurance is a compulsory insurance in Germany designed in order to achieve the social political goal. Before the reform, most spouses had worked on the farm generally, had no working activity outside agriculture, and had therefore not acquired any significant pension insurance rights. Additionally, women who work in agricultural enterprise are subject to agricultural health insurance either as an entrepreneur herself or as a spouse. In addition, there is insurance cover in the agricultural accident insurance. The federal ministry has set itself the task of providing more targeted support to women in rural areas. Data show that we have a long way to go. We develop policies in close cooperation with the Rural Women's Association, and other organizations, as well as targeted support for voluntary initiatives and associations through the Federal Rural Development Program in Germany. The qualitative and quantitative results of the latest study derived a number of recommendations for action, which addresses not only policymakers, but the women themselves, their partners and families, public and private extension and education providers as well, as professional and interest groups. They addresses have now to examine the addresses have now to examine further how to implement them. I want to raise two examples. In order to bridge the gender gap concerning farm operators and farm successors, we need to empower female farm successors and potential senior staff through specialist training courses and networking offers by the educators and advisors, as well as mentoring programs for female farm managers and potential farm successors or for senior staff. Second, not only, but especially for women in agriculture and rural areas, we need a good public infrastructure for healthcare, education, digitalization, and administration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cornelia. Over to you, Fiona. Thank you. Um, so we have taken a strong position on this as a result of the First Minister's ambitions, the previous First Minister's ambitions around women and girls and gender equality. So we set up a Women in Agriculture Task Force who came forward with a um, range of practical recommendations which we are implementing. So since 2019, we have spent... 2.36 million in direct funding to support women in agriculture activities. So with that money, we have delivered research. We have undertaken unconscious bias training um, and offered that to predominantly male agricultural organizations. We have um, de delivered, um, piloted and delivered a um, personal development training course called Be Your Best Self, which is designed to empower women to feel comfortable, um, women that live and work on farms, to feel comfortable to have those conversations within the family business to enable them to grow and gain that confidence and skill set so they can work out what they want to do to contribute to the business and to grow in their abilities. We have undertaken a pilot for rural childcare on islands because we know there are major constraints, particularly in Scotland, given our geographics um, around childcare provision. So although government support is there for every child to have a childcare place, the logistics around that are extremely challenging for glens and remote areas. We are also um, supporting Women in Agriculture Scotland Group, which is a non-government organisation and the Association of Young Farmers 
um, to um, increase their leadership skills for their boards because they are the next generation of our leaders. So we need to work out how to support them. We'll be bringing forward a procurement for a women in business training provision. That is a specific agricultural one, looking at delivering um, prat- delivering the kind of training you need if you fall through the trap door, which is how we call it when you marry into Scottish farming. So you may come from out with a farming community, marry into it, and then you have to learn this new culture and system of running a business, which is quite different to a lot of other businesses in Scotland. And we have also brought forward a practical training fund, which has been massively oversubscribed. So we provide 100% funding for um, women and girls age 13 plus, because they're your next generation coming um, to, um, to get fully funded practical training, everything from quad bikes to um, machinery, to, you know, combines and tractor driving, up to AI work, to um, accountancy work, to personal speech giving, if they are hosting farm visits, that kind of thing. Um, And we also pay, we look at paying the travel costs for the young girls particularly, so they can actually come to the training because that is one of the key barriers. So we have funded over a thousand people to do that training so far, um, and it's making a massive difference. We have a long way to go and we do have a very um, ambitious program to deliver. So this year we have a half a million of funding to um, deliver women in agriculture support. We also have the farm advisory service that does women only specific training and support and seminars to help women that want to have practical discussions. Um, so our yeah, we do have a very ambitious program, um, but we are not finished yet. So we do have quite a way to go. Thank you, Fiona. And uh, really, I want to take this opportunity to thank all three OECD member state representatives for your very insightful responses, because uh, you provided us with a lot of data. And this is ongoing. There's a lot happening in each of your countries. And it is great for us to actually hear because this is the forum set together by the OECD for us to learn, share and work together. So on that note, I think we have a little bit of time for an open Q&A and I have some early questions already received. So uh, I'm going to dive right into some questions. And the first one that I have here is for Minister Lopez. So Minister, question to you from our audience is, what are the commitments of the government to improve the well-being of rural women? Thank you. The first, we have three. The first one is implementing the final agreement to end the armed conflict and build a stable and lasting peace. Everything we are doing is peace because the war was rural. So this has a special meaning for rural policy. The second one is the construction of the public policy for rural women, which is a challenge that you saw huge. We had had all kinds of good intentions, but the application really of that policy to improve the well being and the productive capacity of rural women is still a challenge. We hope we can do that, but everything will be uh, basically uh, departing by the recognition of the law that means the care economy. I think that, that we need to know what's going on with rural women and that can be applicable to all rural women in the world. We know, we need to know exactly how they live, how they work in order to design the road that they will be productive and have economic autonomy. That's what we need for women in general and for rural women. We we want to prove that Recognizing character me, taking it out of the home will improve their productivity, the well-being of the family, the well-being of the country, and the level of the GDP. Those, those are our three challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Wow, that's uh, definitely well, really well uh, articulated. So I'm moving on to the next question, and this one is for Fiona. So Fiona. The question is, what unexpected barriers have you faced in reaching economically disadvantaged women? And can you give an example of how you've 
addressed those barriers through innovative policy? So um, thank you for the question. So we have got some unexpected barriers. So because you self-identify for the training, you opt into it and it's all marketed by our training providers. What we are identifying is we think there's a subset of women that are not coming forward for support. And we think those women are women that are in particular economic hardship or the family business is an economic hardship. So they feel they're unable to leave the business for long enough to train the training so because they're feeling the economic pressure. So we think the cost of the COVID, the impact of COVID and the childcare issues arising from that flip back to the sort of more traditional, you know, familial arrangement, plus the combination of um, cost of living crisis and the global um, pressures on agriculture, particularly around inputs like fertilizer and things like that, all of which have had a bearing on how those family businesses run. So those women we think are not opting in. We don't see them coming forward. So we have a gap that we need help to address. So I would ask if OECD has got any bright ideas, we, we would love to know what they are. Um, but in addition to that, we are looking at a solution, but it's not a quick solution. So um, we are involved in the grass ceiling, which is a 3 million euro Horizon Europe project, looking at how women um, in rural and farm ecology um, can assist across Europe. So it's a three year project and it's got nine living labs in nine countries um, to, to look at learning best practice, where the barriers are, like those women in economic hardship, how you get women to engage, the living labs will be able to draw on agriculture advisors, policymakers, banks, entrepreneur facilitators, so they can learn how to overcome those barriers. And the grass ceiling project will also be looking at supporting the EU member states and governments to provide innovative practices through the CAP plans. And obviously, because we're not within Europe, um, we were invited to join because of the work we do on women in agriculture. I'm hopeful that we will get some early findings from that that can help break down some of these economic barriers because I am concerned these women are, are, are just being left behind and that is the worst thing we can do. Thank you, Fiona. Wow, again, it's uh, it's really, I mean, as I said, I'm very grateful to be uh, having this opportunity to moderate this panel because I'm learning a lot of what is happening around the world that we can all leverage from each other. So it looks like I'm still doing a good job of moderation because we have time for hopefully one or two more questions. So the next question I would like to ask is to Cornelia. What can be done to promote gender equality in agriculture? Thank you very much for that uh, question. Um, I think that forward-looking policies should aimed at improving life situation and opportunities for uh, girls and women in on agricultural holdings. And we need therefore to have a, a closer look on the gender effects of our agricultural policies. And um, what we call gender mainstreaming should be part of all agricultural policies, which is not yet uh, there. Um, I already mentioned that it is uh, difficult for women to inherit a holding and there should be um, lower thresholds and support schemes for women to set up their own agricultural holding. Uh, in, in agriculture, we need more advisory services for these startup of agricultural businesses. And um, we need to, to support networks and mentoring programs and um, support from estate agencies for, for land, uh, for farms, for example. Uh, and I think the whole um, of society need more awareness on women's conditions, especially in, in rural areas and women in, in agriculture. Uh, and this is not uh, only that the women themselves have to be aware about their situation, but also their partners and other stakeholders in the rural area. So there's a lot of work to be done to have a closer look on the situation. Thank you. 
Thank you, Cornelia. And I think we have time for one more question. And this is to Ritsuko. So the question I have is, how have the role and positions of Japanese female farmers in agro-food value chains evolved? How are they likely to continue to change? Thank you, thank you for that question. And the, um, I can say that things have been changed. Um, it used to be um, female farmers are um, have a low visibility, as I said, as I told before. But recently, um, the the representativity is increased, improving now, and so many um, farming uh, rural farmers, uh, female farmers, are um, participated to the decision making process. But I can say that uh, this is not a, an issue of and agriculture itself. This is about this structural problem in the rural area, rural society, cultural, uh, uh, cultural um, things. Um, and recently, and even in Japanese and society, have been changing and more gender inclusive society become and is is um, evolved. So, and uh, as the um, Overall policy in the society changes, and the, um, I think that the, um, the position of the um, female worker, the female worker in the farmland and a farm, is a house has, should be and it will be changed in, um, in according uh, accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, Ritsuko. And uh, before I pass it on to Celine to close our session, it's been just an absolute, I would say, pleasure to be listening and learning from all our speakers. I wanted to add a few uh, points from my end as I was listening to all of you. So I'm coming from Canada, a population of about 40 million. And as I mentioned, it's 10% of our GDP is agriculture. We have gender parity in our federal cabinet. It goes a long way. But how, what, whatever we have not done, we've also noticed that Agriculture, of course, traditionally, and it still continues to be a very male dominated field where fathers pass it on to their sons and to their grandsons. So women, and then there's indigenous women, women of color, immigrant women, I'm an immigrant woman to Canada, have not had the history of working in the field, do not have all the background of how do we actually navigate the bureaucracy that is required to be navigated into regulations and processes and programs, et cetera. One of the aspects that we have in Canada is we have federal programs, grants and contributions in the ag sector, which is not the easiest thing to understand. I'm sure it's the same in many parts of the world. So my team is interestingly working on an item called Ag GPT. I'm sure many of you have heard of chat GPT, we thought, how do we make it easier for women? And of course, for everyone in the field, but especially women and immigrants and rural women, indigenous women who do not actually have the experience of understanding the bureaucratic language. How do we make it more natural language for them? So in the beginning I mentioned is, I'm actually leading digital data and innovation in the Federal Department of Agriculture. And so my team is working on Ag GPT where we can ask questions to better understand programs. And we are really hoping that as we continue this experiment, we can share more information with the other OECD member states so that we can work together and hopefully expand this. The second point that I wanted to make as I was listening to all of the speakers today is we should really continue this conversation. And how can we continue by perhaps working on some specific, perhaps a product, perhaps we run a hackathon with some of our data. Nothing has to be perfect because we are in this together to learn, share and grow together and make it really a much, much better place for the women who are entering the field of agriculture and food systems of the future. So this is my, I would say, 
parting words in, in my moderator role here is how can we come together and experiment on a data sharing platform together? My background is digital and data, so I have a lot of ideas to bring to the table from a technology perspective to work with all of you. So I will leave it there. And I say now is with absolute pleasure that I'd like to pass on the microphone to Celine to close this awesome webinar. So over to you, Celine. Well, thank you uh, to all speakers, to uh, Minister Cecilia Lopez, to, to you, Vidya, um, Assistant uh, Deputy Minister. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you all around today, uh, around this virtual table. And I think we've had um, uh, wonderful presentations and great insights on how uh, your countries are collecting information and using it to inform policies. If I had to summarize my learning, well, First thing I heard is, um, well, we have to make women visible. Um, they are there, they are working, um, but often they are invisible, meaning that we need a strong political commitment. We heard it from Colombia. We heard it from several other countries. Strong political commitment to make women in rural areas visible. Um, we need to learn more about how, they part how women participate to um, the agricultural workforce, what is the role on farms, um, uh, why um, don't they inherit uh, land? Uh, well, we heard about cultural norms, unconscious bias, the need to um, overcome these barriers. Uh, um, and um, clearly, um, well, this cannot change if we don't collect the right information and if we do not provide the right set of information to everyone, not just women, you know, everyone working in food systems. Um, so, what would I do um, uh, if I could? Yes, I would invite everyone to to continue this conversation and and to just try to develop this uh, information base. Uh, this is available in some countries. We've seen that you've made uh, quick progress. Uh, if we if we look at the Scottish and the German examples, you know, through uh, surveys, uh, proper. Um, data collection, well, we can get a quick progress and then address the problems. Uh, so let's continue this. Um, I would say that, um, well, I, I agree with the chair. I think there's scope for international cooperation on this and, and we will certainly be stronger if we do work together. So I will invite everyone here um, to, to continue um, the conversation and to join forces to build better um, evidence on women in food systems and then better policies on women in food systems. Um, in terms of housekeeping, we'd like um, everyone to take maybe 30 seconds uh, to answer um, a poll about this event. Um, this is coming on screen, uh, so please uh, fill the poll. Um, we will. We have received many questions uh, in the chat, so we're going to send um, the answer, so the questions uh, to the speakers and send you the answers uh, in the future. Um, and, and maybe uh, it's time at least for the speakers to get uh, um, a group pictures because we haven't had the chance to do that. So if anyone who is here on Zoom could uh, turn on the cameras, we could have this picture taken. And I will stop here and, and thanking uh, everyone. Uh, Chair, back to you. Thank you, Celine. So I think, yes, as people are filling out the survey for all of the speakers, if you could quickly turn your cameras on and uh, we'll get a nice group picture. So just give us a minute. I think we are all on. I'm doing a quick check. Yes, I believe we are all on. So time for a quick picture. So smile, please. Okay, we got a great picture. Thank you so much. And once again, to everyone, I know that we have participants from around the world here in many different time zones. And some of you, it is the middle of the night for you or the others, it's the, it's the early in the morning. So a sincere thanks to all our speakers who have been who are joining us from around the world, as well as to all members of our audience from different member states. Really hope that this presentation has spurred some creative discussions to be had in your individual member states. 
as well as also thinking of how we can come together, continue the conversation and move the yardstick forward. Thank you so much.